welcome. Uh, this is Farah Rahman. I'm an infectious disease fellow at Eichen School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Um, I'm giving the second part of my uh, lecture series on HIV. Uh, this lecture is going to be on the clinical manifestations of acute and early HIV and AIDS diagnosis. Um, so some definitions, um, early HIV infection means approximately a six month period following HIV ac acquisition. So after the, the patient is infected with HIV, it's that six month period that follows. And then there's acute HIV, which is the symptomatic time period of the early infection. So some clinical features, um, Asymptomatic infections, it's this estimated, it's of a wide estimate, 10 to 60% of patients with early HIV infection won't have symptoms. In patients who have symptoms in acute infection, the usual time HIV exposure to development of symptoms is two to four weeks. There's some incubation periods um, that are as long as 10 months, but usually you'll see those symptoms two to four weeks after. So some of those symptoms I, I touched on in my first lecture. So the most common, fever, fatigue, myalgias, adenopathy, uh, usually non-tender, usually in the axillary region, cervical and occipital nodes are common places. Then you have oral pharyngeal findings, um, sore throat is common. And then rash is also pretty common and eruption occurs 48 to 72 hours after the onset of fevers, it persists five to eight days. It's usually in the upper region, so upper thorax, collar region, face, it's, it's uh, most involved. Also GI symptoms are common, so nausea, diarrhea, anorexia, and weight loss, and then neurologic symptoms like headaches. So overall pretty nonspecific, but things to watch out for when you have a patient with risk factors uh, coming into your clinic or to the hospital with symptoms like these. And so this is just in chart form from up to date, some of those common things that present um, of those clinical manifestations of so fever being one of the most common, followed by fatigue, myalgia, skin rash, like I mentioned, headache, pharyngitis, sore throat, cervical adenopathy is a common one. If you remember from my first lecture, uh, one of the questions that the patient had presented with some cervical adenopathy, arthralgia, night sweats, and diarrhea. And this chart kind of divides uh, uh, the demographics, male, female, it was a sexual acquisition, IV drug acquisition. And this is the, the recommended algorithm for HIV diagnosis. Um, it, you will may likely see on your step exams, this is what's used in the United States. Um, so we usually use the fourth generation HIV-1-2 uh, immunoassay. And so this is the algorithm that follows that test. So if you have a patient that you want to test HIV, you would get this test. If it's positive, the test further differentiates into the HIV-1 or HIV-2 antibody. So if the HIV-1 is positive, then you have an HIV-1 infection. HIV-2 is positive, you have an HIV-2 infection. If both are positive, you have a mixed infection, HIV-1 and HIV-2. If it's negative, you have to do a little bit more digging, and then you would get the RNA level, which is the viral load that I talked about during the first lecture. If that's positive, you have an acute HIV-1 infection. <coughs> Excuse me. And if that's negative, it's a, it's a negative, it's a negative uh, HIV test. And that was, that was a false positive that you first got. So this is a nice chart, um, divides the time period on some of the tests that we have available. So as you can see here, we have the fourth generation. It's to uh, test pretty quickly, you know, once somebody's infected with HIV, it's like an average of 10 to 20 days. You know, the uh, HIV RNA level will test it even uh, prior to that at the 10 day mark. There is a slight window period here, um, so you would want to wait um, if you if a person had a a, a risky exposure. Um, you would want to, and if it was negative, it would be a good idea to test uh, down the line as well. And then here you can also see 
you know, this is the HIV RNA plasma, how, when it becomes, how it becomes elevated. So it grows, you know, becomes uh, increased in, in this time period, then followed by the HIV 1P24 antigen. And then here the antibody is kind of the last one that, that you'll see. Um, these are the older tests, the first to third. Uh, right now we, we, we do use a fourth generation in the United States. This is a nice chart from uh, UC Davis. So important fact to note, um, the diagnosis of acute HIV is extremely important because now the guidelines say that you want to start treatment immediately. So need prompt initiation of antivirals, ARTs, to reduce likelihood of HIV transmission to others and can reduce the size of the HIV reservoir for the infected patients. So basically, you want to make the diagnosis as quickly as possible and you want to start medication as quickly as possible. And so some important labs to check, so the CD4's T cell count, and then the viral RNA, which I will um, call the viral load. So those are two things that, that are important in diagnosis of HIV and AIDS, and kind of uh, I'll go in this lecture about certain opportunistic infections associated with CD4 counts. So moving on to those opportunistic infections. So all these, although these infections are associated with later stage of HIV disease, it can sometimes occur during transient times uh, when the CD4 is low during early HIV infection. And like I mentioned, these opportunistic uh, infections are related to the particular CD4 count of the patient. And I'll go into that. Um, now, so all CD4 counts, things to watch out for, tuberculosis and bacterial infection. So basically it doesn't matter what CD4 count you're at, these are things that can occur at any CD4 count. So we'll start with TB and kind of touch briefly on, on some of these infections. So TB, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, um, HIV contributed to a significant increase in TB in the United States. Um, there was a, a decrease in new TB cases in persons with HIV in the U.S. Um, it's stable in foreign-born persons with HIV in the United States. The risk of mortality with a co-infection, a patient that has both TB and HIV, is greater than a, a patient that only has TB alone. And untreated HIV contributes to the risk of reactivating a latent TB. And so bacterial respiratory infections are also something to watch out for in patients in, at all C to 4 counts. It's, it's a common cause of morbidity in people living with HIV. Um, recurrent pneumonia is an AIDS-defining illness. Um, so streptococcus pneumonia and haemophilus species are the most common of community-acquired pneumonia in this population. And there is an increased frequency at all C D4 counts. Also something to watch out for a bacterial gastrointestinal infection. So the rates of gram-negative enteric infections, so gram-negative GI infections, are at least tenfold higher in HIV-infected adults versus the general population. So that's something definitely to look out for in those patients. And bacteria that's most frequently isolated by culture in the United States, at least, is Salmonella, Shigella, and Campylobacter. So those are some common ones to watch out for. So now I'm going to divide, uh, go down this lecture and divide it by the CD4 count. So I'll go from highest to lowest. So CD4 count less, uh, less than or equal to 250. The infection to watch out for is coccidiomycosis. So I'll go through this. Organisms are C. imidis and C. posidasi. So coccidi imidis is typically in California in the United States, and posidasi is, is outside of California. So coccidi mycoses, it's a dimorphic fungus. There's some uh, two different forms, the environmental form. It's filamentous with septated hyphae that grows in soil and become airborne and can be inhaled. Then there's the invasive form that's at 37 degrees uh, Celsius, and that's these spherules that contain hundreds of these small structures that are called endospores. So here's some pictures of that. Here's that sp the spherical thick wall, endospore, sporulating spherules, mature spherules containing small uninucleate endospores. 
And so some clinical manifestations to watch out for when, um, if you see patients uh, uh, with coxy, coccidiomycosis, so again, CD4 count greater than, than uh, 250, typically presents as an acute or subacute localized um, pulmonary infection that mimics community-acquired pneumonia and sites of infection, so pulmonary, skin, musculoskeletal, the CNS, and lymph nodes of the liver. So here's some pictures you can see, um, at least this is some of the skin sites here on the hands, the lips. Um, pulmonary, it can uh, manifest in different ways. You can have pneumonia, cavitary lesions, or solitary nodules or pleural effusions. So these are some of those uh, ways those uh, patients can present. So when you have a CD count uh, for less than 200, you want to think of pneumocystis. So pneumocystis gerovecchi, it's also called PCP. So throughout this part, I'll call it PCP pneumonia. It's, a, it's a, a, just, um, an acronym for pneumocystis gerovecchi. So it's a fungus. It's occurred in 80% of patients with AIDS prior to ARVs and, and prophylaxis. And in one of my, my last lecture, I'll go over treatment and, and prophylaxis. So I, I won't touch, it, touch on the medications uh, during this lecture, but something just as a, a preempt for, for next week. So this is an airborne transmission can be a new infection or a reactivation of an old infection. And 90% of patients with PCP pneumonia, pneumocystis pneumonia, have a CD4 count less than 200. And these are some of the clinical features. These are, this is a very typical CT scan that you can see with a patient that has PCP pneumonia and also this kind of fluffy looking uh, chest X-ray. And so going down, so CD4 count less than 150, you want to think of histoplasmosis. So histoplasmosis is another fungal infection caused by histoplasma capsulatum. It's endemic to central and south central United States. So kind of buzzwords for your um, board exam. So they call the Mississippi and Ohio River Valley areas and also uh, regions of Latin America. And so it grows in soil, enriched by bird or bat guano, bird roost, chicken coops, cat, caves with bats. The caves with bats is an often um, buzzword uh, with uh, some of these um, board exam questions. And it's a dimorphic growth, so it has a mold form and a yeast form. The yeast narrow based budding and maybe within macrophages or in tissues. And so this is a life cycle from the CDC website of, of um, the biology of the histoplasmosis. And this is a nice map of what I'm talking about, uh, central, south central United States, Mississippi, and Ohio River Valley areas. So clinical manifestations of histoplasmosis, it can be asymptomatic or symptomatic, acute or chronic, vocal or disseminated. So it has a, a variety of manifestations often disseminated in HIV patients less than, uh, with uh, CD4 count less than 150. So 150 is that number. And some of those symptoms include fever, fatigue, weight loss, hepatosplenomegaly, cough, chest pain, dyspnea. 50% have respiratory complaints and, and uh, chest radiograph often and show some of those opacities and can mimic pneumocystis pneumonia. So those patterns that I showed you in the chest x-ray and the CT with pneumocystis, you can kind of see that same pattern with histoplasmosis. And so other manifestation I mentioned, the hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy, sepsis, CNS involvement, and, and GI involvement. And so these are some pictures. You see those like bilateral uh, pulmonary tiny nodules, these ground glass pulmonary infiltrates here, and some of these indurated ulcers, so skin manifestations here. And so moving on, so CD4 counts less than or equal to 100, things you want to think about are toxoplasma and cryptococcus. And I'll go over both of those. So toxoplasmosis, it's a protozoan parasite, the way it can present encephalitis, rhinitis affecting the eyes, pneumonitis affecting the lungs, and disseminated disease. So some of the risk factors are exposure to cat feces, undercooked red meat or raw shellfish, and most infections are reactivation. And so here's a, a kind of another life cycle of, of toxoplasma. You know, you have this uh, 
and a risk factor exposure to cat feces. You have these fecal um, oocytes. Humans have the contact with that, kind of disseminates this, uh, you have a consumption of tissue cysts and, and undercooked meat. Um, and you can have uh, involvement in the brain, and that's it's a common thing. And I, I have a picture, yeah. So kind of those uh, one of the buzzwords is the brain enhancing lesions here. So it's very typical for toxoplasmosis with us um, uh, brain involvement with CNS involvement. Moving on to Cryptococcus, so another uh, fungus, yeast-like round fungus, this has a polysaccharide capsule, reproduces by narrow-based budding. And um, some of those cryptococcal species to be aware of is Cryptococcus neoformans and Cryptococcus gadi. And neoformans is worldwide. Gadi is often found in Australia, subtropical regions, and the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so uh, crypto, Cryptococcus has CNS manifestations a lot of the time, like meningitis. So you can have cryptococcomas uh, and gelatinous pseudocysts. And I'll show you some of these pictures here. This is an MRI of a crypto, uh, cryptococcoma in the medulla. Um, here is a coronal section of the brain showing the cryptococcoma in the basal ganglia. There, you see that there. And then... Here in the in the left parietal cortex shown with a swelling um, in this in this type of MRI, and you have an enhancement of the left parietal lobe. So some CNS manifestations of cryptococcoma. And so moving on, so CD4 counts less than equal to 50. The biggest thing to think about is a MAC infection, so mycobacterium avium complex. So here, disseminated MACs, an independent predictor of mortality. Some of the modes of transmission, ingestion, inhalation, inoculation with the GI and respiratory tract. Like I said, usually CD4 less than 50. And more susceptible, if your viral load is, is greater, so greater than 100,000, if you have a history of previous opportunistic infections, and if you're colonized with MAC, if you're colonized with uh, mycobacterium avium complex, those are some risk factors. Um, again, it's pretty nonspecific clinical manifestations of the way the patient comes in. So fatigue, fever, weight loss, diarrhea, abdominal pain, hepatosplenomegaly, and adenopathy. And so I think this is lastly what I'm going to talk about in regards to kind of AIDS-defining illnesses. So AIDS-related Kaposi sarcoma is an infection with human herpes virus 8, HHV8. CD4 count usually less than 200 uh, is where we see uh, patients present with this. So they're defined as a low-grade vascular tumor. It's usually located on the lower extremity, face, oral mucosa, genitalia, along the GI tract, and the lungs. So those are some of the common places you want to think of Kaposi sarcoma, which is this vascular tumor. And so this is a picture of the New England Journal of Medicine. Oral involvement is common with Kaposi sarcoma. Again, that vascular tumor growth. And this is just kind of summary. So I know that was a lot of information I, I spit at you, um, but this is a, a nice chart that kind of summarizes everything. And it's a good way to think of these opportunistic infections. You want to divide them by CD4 count. It's, um, it's a good way to take care of your patients. It's also you know, a good way to, to study for your boards because they will definitely test you on these. So just uh, try to remember how I divided it. You want to go uh, usually at 200, you know, greater than 500, you're thinking of kind of any infection that a regular person can get, so community-acquired organisms. And like, two, like I said, around that 200 to 500 mark, you want to think of TB, um, less than 200, PCP pneumonia, so pneumocystis gerevechi, cryptosporidium I didn't talk about, but that's also something to watch out for, Canada, fungal pneumonia, less than 100, Toxo, some of the other ones you also want to think of HSV and CMV. Uh, less than 50, um, Cryptococcus I talked about, um, MAC, and primary CNS lymphoma. But basically, I just want you to organize this in your mind. It's a, a lot of information that, that, I, uh, that I presented, um, but something to just keep it uh, straight. And so I just want to end on some practice questions. Um, so I think I just have two with the first one. So we have a 28-year-old male presents with painless, violaceous skin nodules with surrounding edema on his lower extremity. Patient states that he has sex um, with men. His past medical history is significant for AIDS. 
His CD4 count is 55, currently not taking any medications for his AIDS. On his exam, vitals are normal, but you notice these nodules on his lower extremities. What is the most likely cause of your physical exam finding? If you remember from my first lecture, you know, a lot of these questions are long. You want to just focus in on those key phrases. So things to focus on, the CD4 count, and obviously these physical exam findings and the location. So is it A, human herpes virus type 6, so HHV6? Is it B, human herpes virus type 8, HHV8? Or is it Epstein-Barr virus, EBV? So if you want to pause the video here, you can, because I'm going to go on to the next slide, which will have the answer. And the answer is B. So human herpes virus type 8, HHV8. So this is a Carposi sarcoma. It's that vascular tumor. And like I said, it can develop in patients with AIDS, infected with uh, human herpes virus type 8, and presents with these painless, violaceous skin nodules, often have oral involvement, like I showed you with that picture before. Okay, this is a long question. This is from the University of Washington, but I think it's a very important question that I remember getting tested on, not only in my board exams, but also when I was on the, the, the wards, um, getting tested by my attending. So an important, uh, I want you to play, uh, pay close attention to this. So a 30-year-old man has long-standing HIV infection, poor adherence with antiretroviral medications, and is admitted to the hospital with a three-week history of progressive dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, and fever. He's tachycardic, he's tachypnic, and his oxygen saturation is 92% on room air. His chest radiograph shows bilateral diffuse hazeopathy, so that's that picture there. And arterial blood gas demonstrates partial pressure of arterial oxygen of 65 millimeters um, Hg and alveolar uh, arterial gradient of 40. Additional lab studies showed hemoglobin at 11.5, lactate dehydrogenase at 650, plasma beta deglucan at 620. An empiric therapy for pneumocystis pneumonia is initiated with IV Bactrim. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which one of the following is a recommended indication for starting corticosteroids in a patient with pneumocystis pneumonia? So I know this question is very tough and it is uh, maybe above your level right now. Um, and there's a lot of information and I don't expect you to know this, but basically what the question is diagnosing is getting to is that this diagnosis, the pneumocystis pneumonia. So all those words, all that they were trying to say is, hey, this patient has pneumocystis pneumonia. So, and the treatment for pneumocystis pneumonia, will, which I will go over in a later lecture, is intravenous trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, what we also call Bactrim in the United States, but that's the generic, the generic name, and that's the, the gold standard treatment for pneumocystis pneumonia. But there's also recommendations on starting steroids for these patients too. And so the question is, which one of the following is the recommended indication for starting corticosteroids in a patient with pneumocystis pneumonia? Is it a hemoglobin less than 12? Is it an LDH, a serum lactate dehydrogenase greater than 500? Is it plasma beta deep blue can greater than 500? Is it bilateral ground glass opacity on chest imaging? Or is it an AA gradient greater than or equal to 35. So again, a lot of things that you might not be aware of, but um, basically the question is, this person has pneumocystis pneumonia, when do you want to start steroids? What is the marker that you would start steroids on this patient? And I don't expect you to know the answer, so it is a tough question. And the answer is the AA gradient. So when it's greater than or equal to 35, that's one of the criteria to start steroids on patients with pneumocystis. So some of the other criteria, it's uh, arterial blood gas, which is a partial pressure of oxygen less than 70, the AA gradient is greater than 35, or if the patient is hypoxemic. So this patient wasn't, he was a uh, 92 on room air, but if there's ever a patient um, that's, you know, needing oxygen, uh, needing to be ventilated, I mean, those are, those are criteria for starting steroids. Again, that's a, a, this is definitely a tough question, um, but something that I want you to be aware of because this will definitely come up on, on your uh, exams and, and when you're on the, in the hospital doing rounds. Um, 
So things to remember. Um, these are my references if you want to check on any of the things that I said, if I, uh, nothing makes sense, um, some uh, ways you can get your questions answered. And I thank you for uh, listening to my lecture and I hope you learned something.